since 1970, the Environmental Society has worked towards environmental sustainability through public education and policy development and community events. It's become the voice for the environment that the public depends on. It also produces reliable sources of information on a wide range of topics. We encourage you to check out the website for more information and to consider becoming a member if you're not already one at www.environmentalsociety.ca. And to receive email notifications about coming events in the sustainability speaker series, we invite you to contact the email address info at environmentalsociety.ca. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Branimir V. Branimir is a Saskatoon-based biologist, photography instructor, and internationally published environmental photographer. He obtained a master's degree from Dalhousie and a doctorate from Queens, both in the field of genetics. He also has a master's degree in sustainable environmental management from the University of Saskatchewan. As a photographer, Branimir frequently contributes his skills to local non-governmental organizations with the aim to promote the appreciation and protection of natural environments and cultural legacies. In 2013, he was recognized by the Canadian Environmental Law Association for extensive participation in several key environmental NGOs and for using his photography to advance environmental conservation. Branimir has also published two award-winning books on prairie conservation, The Great Sand Hills, A Prairie Oasis, and The Islands of Grass. As a volunteer, Branimir served several boards of directors for several environmental NGOs. He's the former president of Nature Saskatchewan and Saskatoon Nature Society. Currently, Branimir is working closely with the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, the Saskatchewan chapter, and with Wild About Saskatoon, the group that puts together the nature city festivals that we enjoy. Welcome, Branimir. Thank you, Gail. Um, we'll start with sharing screen. Okay, how does that look? Looks good. You got the sound, you got the sound, music, excellent. So, uh, <clears throat> hello, good evening. Thank you for um, attending the, this webinar from the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. And I would like to uh, thank Gail and people from SES for giving me the opportunity to give a presentation tonight. I hope we'll have a lively discussion at the end. Um, <clears throat> this presentation was planned, planned probably over a year ago, and we wanted to talk more about, focus more about the nature-based solutions for climate change. But then almost a year later, things changed and uh, there are a few new topics that emerged. So I changed my presentation a little bit and focus more on biodiversity and how the measures to protect biodiversity could help us deal with climate change to uh, mitigate and reduce the emissions and also um, have some measures to combine protection of biodiversity and climate change mitigation. So that's my introduction and uh, I would like to start my presentation with a rather stark warning by the 2019 Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The report that stated that nature and its vital contribution to people, which together embody biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services, are 
deteriorated. So I hope you have your microphone turned off and this is just a weird sound happening in the internet sphere. So what we are looking here is how much deterioration of the earth system do we have? How much is it there? The image that the map that see frustration that you see now is um, basically a modified, modified um, safe boundaries illustration from the Stockholm Resilience Institute. Uh, this map is from a rather older paper, 2009, but I like it because it's simpler than the ones that I saw published later. So basically, um, they introduced the concept of planetary boundaries as a safe operating space for humanity. So what are the planetary boundaries? They intend to represent Earth system processes which if pushed over a certain limit could generate unacceptable system change, right? As you can see from the illustration, we have overstepped three out of eight safe planetary boundaries, biodiversity loss, which is impacted mostly by the land use change, nitrogen overload and climate change. Agriculture has a large role in all three stressors Hence my interest in the ways how we can minimize the impact of agriculture on the environment. That's one of the reasons why you hear a lot about agriculture um, tonight. Also agriculture, considering that we live in Saskatchewan has a huge impact on land use patterns and land use change that we see in our province compared to other provinces. So in this report, uh, the authors warned that the existence of the world that we have known and benefited from now depends on our actions as planetary stewards. So for this crowd, I don't need to talk too much about the climate change, but this presentation is going to be recorded. So I'll have a little bit of introduction. Sorry if that is boring you, but who knows who's going to listen to this. So humans started adding fossil um, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere about 300 years ago and accelerated land use based emissions but converting forests into croplands and pastures. The unintended consequences of these activities um, is the anthropogenic increase is atmospheric concentration of CO2, which now we believe is changing our climate. Almost all of the world nations have committed to limit the global warming to less than two degrees over the pre-industrial levels with the aspirational target of one degree Celsius, meaning that two degree Celsius target is becoming exceedingly challenging. And we really have to uh, not only uh, reduce our emissions, but also use the measures how to reduce the uh, CO2 concentrations from the atmosphere. In the 2019 special report on climate change and land use by the UN uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I will refer to it as the IPCC, warns that we have to fundamentally change how we manage the land, how we produce and how we consume food and we have to substantially reduce food waste in order to minimize the effect of the climate change. In the same year, 2019, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, it is a mouthful, so I'll refer to it later as IPBES. This is the organization parallel to IPCC so IPPS released an assessment report on biodiversity and ecosystem services. This landmark report warns that nature and biosphere integrity are declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history with negative impacts on people around the world. The report also stressed the need for a fundamental change how we interact with natural environments. Closer to home, 
<clears throat> the latest World Wildlife uh, Living Planet or World Wildlife Fund Living Planet report documents the population of all assessed species here in Canada generally stayed at the same level. Some populations went up and some went down. However, there is a drastic decline in species considered to be at risk of conservation concern. So if you look at the, some of the elements that we have here in the report, I just pulled a few out, that the populations of Canadian species at risk nationally, um, which are determined or assessed, named by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, have declined by 59% on average from 1970 to 2016. At the same time, the populations of species of, globally, of global conservation concern, which is assessed and, uh, as threatened uh, on the IUCN red list, have also declined in Canada by 42% on average in the same time period. So <clears throat> at the risk species in Canada face an average of five threats, including the acceleration threat of climate change. I will not mention what all the threats they determine. We can talk about it later in the discussion. So in, in conclusion, um, basically what is relevant to this presentation is a statement that conservation efforts targeting single threats are unlikely to be successful. So new approaches tackling multiple threats are needed to stop wildlife loss in Canada. So we are talking about climate change, invasive species, urban development, transportation, agriculture activities, and so on. So we have established two major sources of global threats, which is a climate change and biodiversity loss, which are really kind of critical for us to tackle as soon as possible to not to get in even more difficult situations. So what we look at the graph here is uh, we're looking at the Canada's uh, greenhouse gas emissions from 1990, 1990 to 2017 uh, divided by sectors. What I wanted to show you here, what is important, even with all of the commitments that we are going to reduce the emissions to pre-industrial levels, Canada is not achieving those targets to achieve. So we need to reduce, we need to reduce emissions. At the same time, we have to remove excess carbon from the atmosphere. So we have a two-pronged approach. Let's see how the Canada measures compared to other countries regarding CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. Although we are not the largest greenhouse gas emitter, Canada is rocking embarrassingly high among other countries, especially um, if we look at the um, greenhouse gas emissions per capita, um, uh, our emissions are rather large. There are 15.5 tons of CO2 equivalent per person and not too many countries emit more per each citizen, Saudi Arabia, USA, Australia, and China. You can see on the graph here um, on the bar, bar chart is the total emissions and the points, the blue points are emissions per capita. So you see here a lot that maybe our emissions are not very large, so we don't need to do much to reduce the emissions. However, considering the amount of people who produce their emissions, I don't think we can be proud what we are doing. So although many people typically attribute greenhouse gas emissions to energy productions, there are other important contributing activities such as transportation and agriculture. The agriculture, forestry and land use sector was responsible for about one quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions for a rather large, a rather large amount of emissions. So you see the graphs of the um, greenhouse gas emissions equivalents by sector, um, that is for world. And here on the side, we see the, from Saskatchewan uh, resilience, um, prairie resilience report, uh, estimates um, what are the emissions in agriculture. 
you see 24%. So there's a lot of confusion here. What is really included in that amount? So we have to include all of the aspects of agriculture that is emissions from activities. So uh, burning fossil fuels, but also we have to include emissions from uh, generation production of fertilizers. And also we have to include emissions that are uh, being generated from land use change, primarily conversion of grasslands, less forest into cropland, and especially in our conditions, conversion of wetlands into grasslands, which is a large source of greenhouse gas emissions. So <clears throat> increase in greenhouse gas emissions have been linked to raising temperatures. And the Canada's Changing Climate Report commissions by the Environment and Climate Change Canada, released in April 2019, paints a rather bleak picture. It reveals that since 1948, Canada annual average temperature over land has warmed by 1.7 degrees Celsius. And that Canada is on average experienced warming that is twice the rate of the rest of the world. Why is that happening? We see that there is the higher warming rates are seen in the north, the prairies in northern British Columbia. So because of our, our geographical location, having a large portion of the Arctic environment, which is uh, rising in temperature much, much higher than the rest, that is why um, our average increase in temperature is higher than the world. If we just look at Canadian North, the average increase is about 2.3 degrees Celsius, almost three times the global average. And that has a quite a profound uh, impact on the people living in the North and also the wildlife uh, that will not have time to um, adjust to such a rather drastic changes in climate conditions. Together with the rising temperatures, how we're doing with time, okay. Together with the rising temperatures, um, the ECC report reveals Canada experience increase in precipitation. And also extreme fire events will become more frequent. And there'll also be the increased chance of coastal flooding. And we have been witness to the large forest fires that are increasing frequency and intensity over the last few years, as well of dramatic um, floods. So more intense rainfalls. There was a study that showed that not, uh, maybe there is a slight change of actual, the amount of rainfall received during the year, however, those rainfall events are much more intensive and, and happening with strong intensity of the short period of time. And we will have to adjust our infrastructure to cope with those sudden uh, uh, rainfall, intensive rainfall events. What you see here is um, basically um, rainfall, a flooding in Maple Creek that was in June of 2010. When I was there, actually, this is the worst case that impacted me. I was um, leading a photography workshop in the Sand Hills. It was raining so much, it was muddy, that I took the group to Maple Creek. From a leader, we drove to Maple Creek and tried to do some photography there. And while we were there, it's a huge wall of water came into the city because one of the dams near, near the city breached and huge amount of water just flushed and created quite a huge damage in the city. Um, <clears throat> the ECC report warning that, um, as I said, the intense severity of heat waves and rainfall will become more intensive. Um, <clears throat> also, what we can expect to happen that under medium emission scenarios, Glaciers in Canada will lose between 74 and 96 percent of the volume by the end of the century, which could again impact the amount of water that we're getting for drinking for our cities and for agriculture irrigation. Uh, the cost of extreme heat events to the society on the rise. From 1982 to 2008, the cost of catastrophic and trouble events annually 
range from 250 million to about 500 million. Since 2009, so in last uh, 10 years, in eight out of nine years, these costs have ballooned up to 1 billion or more a year with about 1.8 billion on average. So what you see here is an image that uh, one summer we were down in East End on the NCC old man on his back heritage and conservation area. And there's a huge amount of smoke that originated from North forest fires in North Saskatchewan. So even we have a large province, but even forest fires that are happening in the extreme North of the province will have health impact, could have health impact people living in extreme South. Um, <clears throat> so when you look at the focus of the climate mitigation is to reduce the energy transportation and agriculture sector emission. So this requires massive deployment of low carbon technologies between now and 2050, which is our kind of artificial targets. Further progress towards these targets could be made by deploying negative emission technologies or NETs, which remove carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it and store it for long periods of time. However, it is very important to point that these negative emission technologies are best viewed as additional component of mitigation effects, not a substitute. So that when people say, oh, don't worry, we'll have this negative emission technologies, we'll just capture the carbon, we can continue with emitting greenhouse gases as nothing happened. That is not going to work. So uh, in 2019, the US National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine released a report called Negative Emission Technologies and Reliable Sequestration. So they identified six major technical approaches to CO2 removal and sequestration. That is coastal blue carbon, terrestrial carbon removal and sequestration by an energy with the carbon capture and sequestration. Then more technological, it's direct air capture, carbon mineralization and geological sequestration. So I will not go into detail what each one does what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on first um, three, which are uh, more nature-based. There are four negative emission technologies that are ready for the large-scale deployment. That is a change in the forest cover, which will help sequester the carbon. Um, changes in forest and grassland management. Uptake and storage of carbon by agricultural soils. We can do more there. And then also the bad energy with carbon capture and storage. Those uh, entities have low to medium cost and provide the core benefits such as improved forest and agriculture productivity, soil nitrogen retention and soil water holding capacity. I will focus on biology based technologies, the first three on the list. One thing that I want to mention here is um, because of the food demand is expected to increase by mid-century, repurposing a significant amount of current agricultural land that we use for food, and instead, if we try to produce feed, feedstock for bioenergy, uh, we might have a significant effect on food. I will, uh, we have a amount of food that we have, and also those technologies could have far reaching impact of biodiversity. So I do have a little bit of mixed feeling about the bioenergy bio bio with carbon capture and storage. So <clears throat> what are the possible approaches to uh, uh, land carbon, terrestrial carbon capture and sequestration? What we could do is include, we could do forestry practices that avoid conversion of forest land to other land uses basically deforestation, version of non-forest land to forest, afforestation, reforestation, so getting more woodlands. Um, we can improve forest management practices to either increase carbon stocks or increase net removal of carbon for the atmosphere. 
We can also uh, maintain healthy and biodiverse grasslands, especially perennial grasslands, native non-cultivated areas, which capture and store a large amount of carbon below ground, where it's relatively stable uh, in, in forms of soil organic carbon, inorganic carbon, and litter. This has important implications for climate change mitigation. Um, problem that we have with the grasslands and, and mitigating climate change, and then is with a huge rate of conversion of native inter e ecosystems to manage land, particularly cropland. Um, and that rate of conversion has been a large net source of CO2 escape to the atmosphere with a significant depletion of soil carbon stocks. On average, cultivation of previously untilled soils, especially native grasslands, can result in the average decrease in soil organic carbon on 30 per 30% in first five years of conversion. And this is just a graph of the study that was done by the Edward Borg from the University of Alberta. This is from Saskatchewan, actually, our local data, um, where he looked at the difference in soil organic carbon in southern Saskatchewan um, in the prairie region where there is an average drop in the soil organic carbon about 30% first five years. Whereas in the parkland region in more thicker and organic rich soils, that loss could be um, up to 45% in first five years. So there is a one trick here when we think about stories, when we hear the stories that yeah, Yes, uh, carbon capture, sequestration by agriculture, it's awesome. It's going to solve our problems. The problem there is in most optimistic ways, we can get uh, about 0.4% a year by capturing soil by most optimistic management techniques. And if you compare that, so in multiply that five times 0.4, that's 2% gain in carbon. In the same time, we lost between 30 and 40% by converting grasslands into the cropland. So um, everything needs to be taken into consideration. And um, what is the realistic? We have to think about a point in time when we do those, when we do those calculations. And the reason why the perennial grass and capture so much soil and, and store it on the ground is the root system of grasses, which if you look in the left corner there, they're way stronger when deeper. And actually the large amount of biomass in the native perennials is under crops, which have a relatively small roots the majority of the background, which is harvested and, more, and a lot of it is being lost. So <clears throat> a large range of ecosystems contain irrecoverable carbon, which is susceptible to release upon land use conversion. And once lost, it's not recoverable on times climate impact. So this is a graph study that was recently published in Nature Climate Change. They look at the, they look at the times 30 years. So from 2020 to 2050, that's our target to reduce the, the, the uh, effect of, of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If we look at the intact uh, ecosystems on the left, we have a 100% added soil carbon in biomass carbon. So green is carbon above ground and brown is carbon below ground. If we do land use conversion, whether that is converting grasslands to cropland or parkland to cropland, we lose this total 100% of the green biomass above, gra uh, above ground biomass. In terms of soil, we don't lose everything. We just lose a portion of it. There is a large amount of soil uh, carbon, which is stable, and we do not lose it with conversion. Um, when we look at the recovery after a few years, and let's say we start growing forest or we start growing crops, we see there is a, a gradual increase in this above ground biomass in the green, 
And there are also in sl a slight increase into soil carbon recovery, which is that brown area in the soils. However, there is a large amount of irrecoverable biomass that will never, they will never either recover or it'll take a very long time um, to recover. For example, in peatlands, if we drain the peatlands, remove peatlands, uh, there is a very dramatic uh, a loss in uh, organic carbon, which takes a very long time to recover. On the other hand, in the grasslands, it's a little bit faster. If we do spot measurement, we could recover a larger portion of those soil organic carbon that we lost with um, with land use conversion. So we have to think about that. The stories, uh, especially, oh yeah, don't worry if we do a grassland conversion, we'll just recover that organic carbon. Uh, we just planted crops and everything is going to be fine. It is not. So when we think about that, what is the best uh, methodology and best approach that we have is minimize that original lost land use conversion. So we have to protect what is left in our landscapes. And then we have to try to restore what has been lost. And I will refer to that a few times in my presentation. So <clears throat> we are talking a bit more, I mentioned the nature-based solutions for climate change. Um, this spring in February, there was a large symposium in Ottawa with over 400 people gathered. And um, there was a lot of discussion, several day discussion, how best to use a nature-based solution to address climate change issues. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, there are recently two published, two large publications published that look at the global uh, implication uh, application of nature-based solutions um, using natural systems to mitigate climate change by removing carbon from the atmosphere and capture it either in the bi above ground biomass or in below ground biomass. Um, <clears throat> in the studies for the United States, um, determined that the sorry for the global um, natural climate solution could provide in the best case scenario. 37% of the cost effective CO2 equivalent mitigation through 2030. So <clears throat> majority of nature-based solutions, if effectively implemented, also offer co-benefits like water filtration, flood buffering, soil health, biodiversity, habitat recovery, and enhanced climate resilience. Um, in the U.S. study, the maximum mitigation potential of nature-based solutions is around 1.2 billion metric tons, or approximately 21% of the current net annual emissions. Um, the largest mitigation potential comes from forestry, including reforestation, forest management, fire man management. And the next group um, relates to agriculture and grassland management, part group uh, of nature-based solution include uh, wetland management and tidal wetland restoration holding the largest mitigation potential. A similar study relevant for the uh, Canadian conditions will be released soon, hopefully before the end of the year. And what I heard, it will be published in the science advances. So keep an eye on it. Okay, how are we doing with time there? Okay. Um, <clears throat> this next section will focus on the agriculture production and the environment. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of my presentation, agriculture had a large impact on earth systems. Agriculture is considered to be the single largest driver of environmental change. The assignment is also the most impacted by those changes. Through its impact on the land cover change, agriculture is the leading cause of biodiversity loss. And this 
pressure may increase with further crop expansion and intensification, meaning more uh, intensive use of the land, whether that is use of um, agricultural chemicals, herbicides, insecticide, fungicide, or draining of wetlands, converted grasslands. Uh, <clears throat> We are turning more into the high input, low diversity farming systems, which are very efficient, but also they rely on a large amount of external inputs. And the ability of this high input, low diversity farming systems to withstand disturbances caused by the climate change could be diminished if we continue with the business as usual, relying more and more on those external inputs. There is a growing understanding of the links between diversity and ecosystem function and the resilience of the systems to, disturb, to disturbance. So improving diversity, both on the farm and also the landscape levels around the farms would greatly contribute to food system stability and climate risk reduction. Unfortunately, we are going in the opposite direction all around we see that formerly heterogeneous landscapes are becoming more uniform with large areas of annual crops dominating over the greatly reduced and fragmented natural habitats of wetlands woodlands that's what you see there on the left basically shelter belts that's being cut down to make space for a more cropland The current model of high input intensive production of agricultural commodities, they rank high on the provisioning services, meaning we are getting high crop yields, but at very low levels of regulating, supporting, and cultural services, meaning water quality, um, soil stabilization, and basically uh, uh, enjoying the natural environments, both in cultural and personal options personal um, relationship with the landscape we live in. The agricultural intensification led to simplification of landscape structure, loss of diversity, and potential reduction in system resilience because of that simplification system. When you think about uh, uh, what does it mean? Why the simplification of the system is leading to reduction in system resilience? Just think about the impact of COVID um, pandemic on our food systems. And let's say meat processing plants, right? We have a two large meat processing plants. They're very efficient. And when the system is stable, there are no external uh, uh, stressors. It works okay. However, as soon as we have some kind of external stressor, we saw that those processing plants, tube ones, uh, went out of production and that had impact on um, supplying the meat in Canada. So similar system here, if we really rely on this highly optimized systems um, that are more and more rely on the external input, what happens if there are any disturbances, how we are going to be able to maintain a stable and resilient food system. In addition, loss of biodiversity threatens provisioning of ecosystem functioning services, ultimately impacting food security and agricultural sustainability. I put my note here, uh, what is the monoculture? When I came to Saskatchewan 23 years ago, I naively asked people in the know, um, how do you deal with this monoculture systems? What is the impact on the soil quality and also on biodiversity, pest control and so on? But then I was told that we do not have monoculture system in Saskatchewan because we have crop rotation. However, that is true. One year farmer can grow wheat and next year farmer can grow canola. And then week after that, we could go pulses. However, in that first year, farmer was growing wheat. And if the farmer is growing three or four or five or even more thousand acres of same crop, then that and uh, without a uh, uh, much nat native or natural habitat around surrounding it, 
that has a huge impact on by associated biodiversity and also increases of ch chances of um, pests, insect pests that are not desirable in our agricultural systems. So that when I say monoculture, if somebody tells you, no, we don't have monoculture uh, system in Saskatchewan when we do crop rotation, um, just kind of ignore them because uh, in, in many cases, especially with, with, with the market driven decision, what kind of crops are being grown, um, growing canola, snow and canola, it's not a proper crop location. So <clears throat> we do have to re rethink the global food systems and how we interact with the food systems. In addition to the impact in biodiversity, um, global food emissions of systems. Their emissions could preclude achieving the 1.5 and 2 Celsius Paris Accord targets. Even if fossil fuel emissions immediately halted, current trends in global food systems could prevent achievement of this 1.5 degree Celsius climate change target, and by the end of the century can threaten to achieve 2 degrees Celsius um, target. So meeting that 1.5 Celsius target requires rapid and ambition change, and ambitious changes to food systems as well to all known food sectors. So when you look at the graph here on the left hand side, we see the uh, emissions in a, in a dark uh, uh, bar over there. Um, with the current emissions, we will have a hard time reducing emissions to reach that two degrees Celsius limit. If we implement various uh, other measures, individually, for example, switching to plant-rich diets, reducing our consumption of meat, especially that in North America, um, if we healthier diet with the healthy calories, eat less processed food, we have a better chance in that. High yields have the least amount of effect. If you really focus only on higher yields, um, that goal of reaching uh, agriculture emissions to reach the two degrees Celsius target is the least uh, effective method to do that. We use half waste. A lot of the food is being wasted. 30 to 40 percent in some studies even up to 50 percent of food in Canada is being wasted um, and that had huge impact on uh, our ability to deal with uh, climate change. So <clears throat> what I want to I just want to mention there are uh, you can hear a critiques that people who talk about um, rethinking the role of high input, uh, uh, high output, industrial, uh, conventional agriculture. They are trying, people are trying to turn us back, the clock back 100 years and take us back to the days of, of horses and oxen pulling the plow. I'm definitely not talking about that. Um, we do need modern technologies, knowledge, um, to increase the yield and also to have to feed the people and also to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions and um, that a fertilizer leaching nitrogen, phosphorus leaching in the environment. So I'm not completely against technology. Technology is very important, but technology is not a silver bullet that is going to solve all our problems. The problem that I have is with the, some aspects of the conventional high input agriculture practices is the amount of agriculture inputs. So in the effort to increase, the, um, increase and maintain crop yields, agriculture has rapidly intensified over the last six decades, relying heavily on agrochemicals, fertilizers, insecticides, fungicides and herbicides. So the graph that you see here is a study that was done published recently, where the authors look at the data from the Canadian Census of Agriculture, time span over 35 years. 
and they found that most of the agriculture in, in Canada were applied in the prairie and, and central region, which is not surprising. They together represent about 97% of the cropland area. However, uh, we see a dramatic increase in the amount of chemicals used, where on the prairies, fertilizers were applied on 78% and herbicides on 81% of cropland area, and a dramatic increase uh, with fungicide about 40% and insecticide about 50% between 1996 and 2016. So that is one uh, negative side effect of that really push to uh, increase the yield at any cost and in quote, I would say, to feed the world. Uh, I can chat and discussion what I think about that uh, uh, notion and claim that we have to increase the yields of and exports to feed the world, um, which in some cases I think is bogus, but I will talk about that in discussion if anybody is interested in. The problem with this, this um, high input agriculture is in incomes, so farming income. What you see here in the graph is um, plotted the gross farm revenue and the realized net income with government subsidies subtracted. This is in Canada. So when we look at this farm income in high input, high output, high energy use agriculture production model, using the ever increasing quantities of fuel and agrochemicals lowers the farm net income, the money that effectively farmers will be able to learn. So the general uh, uh, sales are going up in this time scale. However, farmers are increasingly spend more and more money on the inputs, whether that's chemicals, fertilizers, um, fuel. So they're earning less and less money. And what is that causing too? That profit margin is very slim. And one, one negative consequence of that is that farmers are getting bigger. People are trying to deal with that really razor thin profit margin by volume. So the farmers are getting bigger and bigger and we see a really very high push to really minimize any kind of uh, disturbance, whether there is a Aspen bluff or a wetland that would reduce that so-called efficiency to produce and increase the yield so the farmers can pay for ever increased amount of inputs. So <clears throat> by focusing more attention on species and functional diversity of agroecosystems, um, by increasing enhancing on farm and landscape scale diversity, we might be able to design and manage agricultural landscapes for better delivery of biodiversity based ecosystem services. Application of agroecological practices will increase the stability of the system and will help reduce the amount of agrochemical inputs and to farm profitability. So in the rest of my, my talk, I will talk quite a lot about that increasing the level on of diversity of and adjacent areas, which will help both biodiversity the bottom line. So there is a study just published recently in Science Advances showing that agricultural diversification will promote multiple ecosystem services without compromising yield. So they look at the, the authors, look at the diversity. It was a mega, it was, sorry, it was the uh, analysis of over 5,000 original studies. So compilation of the results and they look at the above and below ground biological communities and cropping systems and how they can increase resource use efficiency and stability of ecosystem production over time. Overall, the results study that the study found that diversification enhanced biodiversity, pollination, pest control, nutrient cycling, soil fertility, and water regulation without compromising the yield. On the right hand side, you can see what kind of diversity, diversification practices they're uh, applied in the agriculture systems the authors have looked at. 
So this is just a general view, what kind of, um, oh, sorry, I'm advancing the wrong one. Uh, we can talk if anybody is looking at a more specific uh, results of various diversification practices, um, we can talk about later in a discussion. Um, one example of the non-crop diversification, so the diversification of adjacent fields, which will be prairie strip al along the edges of crop fields. They serve as a refugees for pollinators and pest control in insects. So for the sustainable food production, biological diversity needs to be increased to recreate natural control and regulation function and manage the pests and diseases rather than seeking to elim eliminate them by applying chemical inputs. So we have to remember that pollinators improve production of 70% of global important crops and influence 35% of global food supply. So we really have to work on supporting uh, pollinators and natural pest control insect and systems rather than trying to eliminate it, but ever increasing amount of insecticides. So we are getting into Oh, I better kind of speed up here. Um, we are getting into this section on the um, <clears throat> land use planning to recover and restore biodiversity. You have probably heard of the call for the global deal, deal for nature to increase global protected areas um, from 70% of the earth land, which was the target 11 um, scheduled to be completed by 2020. So increase that target to 30% by 2030 and towards the ultimate target of 50% of protected area by 2050. So how can this be accomplished? One proposed framework proposes a baseline of three broad land use conditions that we have city and farm, cities and farms to cover about 18% of the land large wilderness areas to cover 26 of the land, and that includes protected areas. And then we have a shared lands between humans and natures. These proportions of total land use are arbitrary and they really depend on the type of the land use. And I will talk about that, I will re uh, um, refer to it later. Just a brief primer. Um, when we talk about the protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures, we can see the definition here. So <clears throat> over the last 10 years, protected areas have expanded, covering from 14 to about 15.3% of the global, global land and fresh environment, freshwater environments, and from about 3% to 7.5% of marine areas. Uh, however, only 21% of species had adequate representation inside protected areas in 2019. So other effective area-based conservation measures or OECMs um, can be run by privately through non-government groups or organizations, for example, NCC, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Ducks Unlimited, and so on, they run protected areas. They can be community groups, or those protected areas could be run and managed by the indigenous peoples through the indigenous protected and conservation areas. OECMs have been overlooked in most national biodiversity policies and strategies over the past decade. And this situation is rapidly changes. So we, uh, hope is that OECMs could help to address representation shortfall in the global protected area network. Okay, um, there. Okay, so climate change becoming a strong factor in determining the success of the area-based conservation with many predicted biological responses to climate change underway. There is a growing recognition of the necessity to increase climate and biodiversity policy agendas into area-based conservation plan. Uh, 
This map represents attempt to assess the global lab of areas of high importance for biodiversity protection and carbon sequestration um, using two different approaches to conservation. In blue, in, sorry, in green, we see proactive measures where there is a map priority areas of low threat by high irrepressibility. So there are largely intact land, currently they're protected, 2012, sorry, 12% in this category. And the reactive conservation, where we put priority on high threat and high irrepressibility areas. So these are the large refuge for a large number of species, which are in imminent threat from being uh, damaged or impacted by human, uh, uh, human activities. Currently, there are about 21% of these areas are protected. So we do put more emphasis on those areas. Similar studies are being done for North America, where there are mapping areas to protect biodiversity and also find the areas to have a large effect of mitigating climate change. Uh, we can do that by protecting and restoring peatlands, forests, and grasslands to enable carbon sequestration and storage. In this map, what you see biomes boundaries indicated in black and protected areas are indicated in brown. So by mapping this uh, um, climate smart protected areas, um, we can uh, find areas where is the best target to increase the number either the size of the existing reserves or increase the number of protected areas. We also need to think about the increase the connectivity within the landscapes, especially in human, domin human dominant landscapes. What you see in the map here, uh, potential for creating both climate smart or climate effective conservation areas uh, and areas to protect biodiversity especially large areas um, we can work in uh, Canadian North in the boreal forest. There's a little bit about the uh, uh, Rockies and especially on the West Coast. And those areas really have now, there are reactive, uh, reactive conservation areas where their species are imminently threatened. So on the, on the biodiversity scale of the ledger, large protected areas um, are still very important and a cornerstone of biodiversity conservation. They provide suitable space for species that are susceptible to disturbance or habitat fragmentation. However, species populations within and outside protected areas continue to decline. Even large parks and protected areas will continue to lose species over a long term if they're isolated from one another but unsuitable habitat. For example, many migratory species use habitat that are outside of the protected areas for a large part of their life cycle. Focusing on a large protected area conservation strategy alone will not be sufficient without including conservation efforts to protect surrounding small, often isolated habitat patterns. This is particularly important, heavily human dominated landscape, such as agricultural land. For biodiversity conservation, the effectiveness of protected areas significantly influenced by the type of land management of surrounding land. And there are some studies being done as well to show that. So what we need to do, we need to have a complex matrix of wildlife friendly landscapes established to work in conservation um, and that will complement protected area network by providing necessary habitat for some species while facilitating dispersal and adaptation to climate change for others. So <clears throat> we need to increase the efforts to uh, improve the diversity of the uh, habitats of native habitats on our working landscapes. So <clears throat> humans, humans cannot be separate from the uh, natural world and to conserve nature in well-defined but isolated protected areas and leave the rest of the earth for humans to play will not work. 
in a similar way, expanding protected areas with the most, uh, within the most productive areas for human food production, like grasslands and wetlands, could cause displacing agricultural production to less productive regions where more land area would be required to meet existing demand for food production. So what you see here is those three conditions. In general, where we have about 18% of the land uh, used for human settlements and farms, 26% used for large wild areas, and the rest is shared land, those proportion vary between um, cities, um, agriculture areas for agriculture, food production, uh, protected areas, or key biodiversity areas. So this is basically flexibility, what kind of system we can use and assist nature to find enough space and suitable habitat to um, have achieved the goal of conservation, biodiversity conservation. So, given the evidence that intensified agriculture systems are failing to provide functionality and key services um, beyond provisioning, future agricultural landscapes will likely need to be designed to support biodiversity and ecosystem services. And we can accomplish that in composition and structural complexity of landscapes that are used for multiple users. Also, we need to have a biodiversity-based management as an important component of supporting biodiversity and improving agricultural system resilience. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the networks of protected areas need to be complemented by the natural areas in shared lands in these working landscapes. And a few studies show that at least we need to recover and restore about 20% of the native habitat area within those working landscapes. Um, these restoration efforts can be implemented in ways to minimize trade-offs with farm productivity. For, we, for example, we can use uh, shelter belts, we can use prairie strips, um, there are studies showing that up to 10% of agricultural land can be covered in, in prairie strips to get ecosystem services without loss of crop yield and profitability. So how do we sustainably produce food and protect wild nature? In conclusion, if we want to move agriculture for a current low role as the world's largest driver of environmental change, we need a paradigm shift in new system thinking in means of sustainability of food production, maintenance of ecosystem function, mitigation of climate change and protection of biodiversity presents a core strategy for agriculture development. Production of food, fiber, and fuel to support human production needs to be based on sustainable and resilient agricultural systems, especially in the context of increasing variable climate change conditions. We have to conserve vital ecosystem services in farming environments that support long-term agriculture production while minimizing social and environmental impacts on farm and across agricultural landscape. With this, we will increase the resilience of systems and they will be able to cope and adapt to external shocks and to recover more quickly from negative impacts while maintaining their central structural function. We have to maintain and even enhance biodiversity with the agricultural system Uh, and we also have to try and to reduce the trade off um, and we'll make a change. So, for the protected areas, we need to consider designing agricultural landscapes as a mosaic of land uses comprising of agroecologically based farmland, wildlife friendly working lands, and protected areas at various scales. Protected areas are clearly defined in geographic spaces. However, 
they can be less effective if are they embedded in a uniform and degraded agricultural land matrix. To achieve the long-term goals of protected areas, we have to think and we have to act in a more proactively for the land use planning to create that matrix of wildlife friendly agricultural land. So <clears throat> with this, I will end my presentation and ask for questions.